Good morning. This is Wednesday morning's video, and we are going to open up our Bibles and be in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm getting a kind of a running head start into chapter 2. Remember, this whole book, this whole letter of, is written to a church of believers, and it's all about the joy of the Lord. Remember, Paul's writing from a Roman prison, and he's helping them to understand that we can have contentment, joy, in the Lord, regardless of the circumstances, however difficult they may be. We can have joy in the Lord. And the whole letter is about how do we get this joy? How is this played out in our lives? And Paul, in chapter 1, makes it very clear that it begins in our minds. Okay, so if we want to have God's priorities, it's going to have to start by first having God's mind. Again, we're back. See how it fits the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It begins with my mind. That's the beginning. It plays out in my everyday priorities. So remember, in chapter 1, it's all about having a single mind. If I want to have joy in my daily living, how can I have it? It's going to have to be having the heart of God. And that heart is about the spread of the gospel. The, the the heart of my life, the priority of my life is not my physical life, not my physical health, not my physical comfort, but it's the furtherance of God's kingdom. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6, where he says, seek first the kingdom of God and being right with him. And all of the rest of the things that the world worries about, will God will take care of what I'm gonna eat, what I'm gonna wear, what I'm gonna drink, um, where am I going to live? Um, he says, don't take any thought for tomorrow. Because today has enough trouble of its own. And so as we look back at chapter 1, we have got something in front of us. It starts with the word therefore. And so because we are single-minded, now we're going to go further in chapter 2. Whereas in chapter 1, we have a single mind. I love the way Warren Wiersbe puts this. I have a single mind in chapter 1. Now I'm going to have a submissive mind in chapter 2. So if I want to be in life, I'm going to have to live as a servant. And I'm fine with people treating, I'm fine with being a servant until people start treating me like a servant. Then I, I tend to uh, don't like it when people treat me this way. So we're going to dive into this in just a moment. So if you haven't read Philippians chapter 2, stop right now and go read it. You already read it once on Monday when you read the whole book through. Now just read chapter 2. Find words and there's a lot of them in here um, that are difficult. And so come up with your own definition. Write down what, uh, do some research and find out what these words mean. And then we'll come back together and uh, we'll look at it together. So go do that. And if you have, now let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for your spirit. And Father, as we stop right now and are going to look directly at your son Jesus Christ, the standard. And Father, may we in awe and reverence step back but then, Father, may we examine our own hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We begin with kind of an interesting verse. It says, therefore, so because of everything we learned in chapter 1, he's, there's three ifs. If, 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 four ifs. And it's if in the Greek language is just like the English. It's a conditional term. But here in the tense that it's in, it's asking a question, but one that they already know the answer for. So it would be like this. If there is any encouragement in Christ, and there is. If there is any consolation of love, and there is. 
Uh, is there any, if there, because there's, if there's fellowship of the Spirit, and there is, if there's affection and compassion, and there is. So maybe a better translation would be since. Uh, since there is encouragement in Christ. Um, being in Christ, is there things that lifts you up and encourage you? And the answer is totally there is. What is that? Your daily walk with Almighty God, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the written Word of God. These are all encouragement in our lives. Um, is there any consolation of love? Is there any part of this love relationship with God and extending to other people that consoles you when things get hard? The answer is yes. Do we have any fellowship with the Holy Spirit? I hope we do. Is there any affection or compassion, things that draw us together? He says this, make my joy complete. So remember, Paul's saying, I'm in prison, but it's well worth it. If the people that I'm meeting in prison are getting to know the gospel according to Jesus Christ, and if you are growing and through my suffering, you're able to be more bold with your presentation of the gospel. So it says, make my joy complete by being, having the same mind. Now, what's the mind? The same mind that he had in chapter 1, uh, where he says, participation in the gospel. I want you to grow from being born again as an infant all the way to becoming a spiritual parent so that you're reproducing, having the same mind, the same love, united in spirit, intent on what? One purpose. Doesn't this remind you of Ephesians 4, um, the first six verses? Uh, but also, if you go back to James, what he says is, Count it all joy in chapter 1, you when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then when endurance works its full course, it's going to leave you mature. If any of you lacks wisdom, he says, ask God for it. He's going to give. He's not holding back. But it says this. But if you're double-minded, don't expect that you're going to get anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways. And here, it just reminds me uh, of the problem in the church today, um, but, but that was not a problem in Philippi. Um, if we want complete joy, then I, the person who discipled me, if I want them to have complete joy, it's going to be because I'm carrying on with the same heart the same priorities, the, the same mind. I'm not double-minded, but the church today is very much double-minded. And as we get into chapter 2, we're going to see how this is so foreign to the consumer culture that we live in. And the consumer culture that we live in has pervaded the church. Where the church is supposed to be pervading the culture, it's gone the opposite direction. Where people see the church as something there for them, rather than them being part of the church to be used in service. Uh, so the church being here for you is really, really not uh, in this at all. Where do I get everything that I need? Not from the church. I get everything that I need through my daily abiding with God through this relationship that I have with God and that from this relationship with God I'm going to have a supernatural love for others and the vehicle by which I demonstrate my supernatural love for others is through the church who's the head of the church Jesus Christ so in this he says do nothing from what selfishness or empty Conceit. Think about this term humility that we've been talking about. Humility is exactly the opposite of pride. Pride.
pride and selfishness always go together. Um, this selfishness is the root of every other sin. Either whether it's a sin just to, against God, or if it's a sin against God and other people, really the whole problem is self-love, selfishness, pride. And think about it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor, what? As yourself. So in order for him to give us some way of comparison, well, he's saying naturally every one of us is selfish and have self-love and are wrapped up in pride. So take that that you naturally have and start extending that to others. First extend it to God, and then he will supernaturally help you extend that to others. That's why at justification, I have to surrender. Surrender what? Surrender me. Remember Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So it says, we're not, if, if, if we're going to grow in this, it's going to not be through selfishness and empty conceit. If we go back to James 3 and 4, he says, if there's conflict, if there's quarrels among you, where do they come from? These two things, uh, selfishness and empty conceit. If we're having division in the church, guess what? It's because there's sin there. What's the sin? At its most base level is going to be pride, selfishness. What's lacking? Humility. Well, we say, okay, how do we get humility? Well, humility isn't something you get. It's kind of the result of. It's the result of CCR. How do I get humility? I have to be in the Word and have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to convict me. I'm going to agree with the Holy Spirit and confess my sin openly to God and to other people. And then I'm going to turn from my sin in repentance. That's going to produce humility in me. You can't just start out by saying, I want to be humble. Humility is one of those things that once you think you've got it, you've lost it. Remember, humility isn't thinking bad things about yourself. It's just not thinking of yourself, which naturally is all that we ever really think about. But in Christ, how can I, how can I be a slave? How can I serve other people and yet maintain a joyful attitude? That's what all of chapter 2 is about. Look what it says. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with what? Humility where? Humility of mind. Have you ever been doing something and you just feel like you're being used? And even if you're continuing to do it, the whole time your mind is going crazy with all these thoughts about how everybody is putting it to you. Humility of mind, how do I get that? By renewing my mind with the Word. And then the Word and the Holy Spirit have to come together. If you're reading the Word and God isn't convicting you, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. But if you have the Word and the Holy Spirit together, it's going to be producing this conviction, this humility, this process. Then it says this, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Does that not sound like the second, the result of the great commandment? Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Right now, everybody wants justice and everybody wants peace. The question is, how do we get it? Well, 
the way to get justice is not by burning down someone else's stuff. The way to get peace is not by going to war with other people. The way to justice and the way to peace is through righteousness. And that's by surrendering oneself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It alone is the way to justice and to peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Okay, what does that mean? How, how do I extend this to others? I can't extend peace and justice and righteousness to others by forcing them. What's the best way that I can show them that this is real is not by going out and pushing it on them, but rather to deny myself, to deal with my own sin in front of them. It's going to be so different than what they see every day in the world. As I put myself low, they're going to uh, see a difference in me. Now let's keep going. It says this. Verse 5 begins. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. So very rarely uh, can we mimic Christ. I can't mimic anything in his deity, but I can mimic things in his humanity. And here he's saying, there's this humbling of Christ, and then we're going to see this exalting of Christ. Okay, so think about it like this. We'll go through the ins and outs of it. But God had a plan. His plan was that the Son would come and be born, live a life, sacrificial death, and be raised from the dead. Now, that's the Father's plan. However, the Son chose to obey the Father's plan. Okay? Uh, he wasn't forced to do it. He willingly submitted to the Father's plan. Jesus himself said, no one took my life, not even the Father. I laid it down. Okay? He willingly wanted to obey the Father. So there was this humbling where he, he, he he's God. <clears throat> and yet he laid that privilege that came with that. He's still God, but he laid down his divine privilege so that he could become man. He's always been God from all eternity past, never beginning. He'll never have an ending. However, that's his deity. In the conception in Mary, he began his humanity. God and man came together inside the belly of a teenage girl named Mary. How did it didn't stop there? His humiliation kept going. He was born. He had to have parents. He had to learn how to obey. He had to learn how to do things. He had to go to the bath. These, these are things that Jesus had to do that are very humbling things. He had to eat. He had to drink in order to get strength. He had to go through life being led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, how bad did it get? I mean, he had a ministry where people rejected him. Uh, so much so that they said lies about him. They got him arrested falsely. They had him put to death under false pretense. And then the ultimate humility of being buried, dead. But then comes the exaltation. The exaltation of being raised from the dead, uh, being ascended to heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. So we've got this uh, humbling and this exalting. Now, here's where I want to make the connection for you, and then we'll go through and hit on it again. He's saying, have this same attitude in ourselves, which was also in Christ. He, in the incarnation, was humbled. And then in the ascension, he was exalted. Right now, if you are a Christian, you're in the middle of the humbling process. Sanctification. And it's hard. It goes against every fiber of who we are. What's this sanctification process look like? It looks like having faith in an invisible God and having a relationship, an abiding walk with Him where He guides my life. He reveals problems and I agree with Him. 
and confession and repentance. What's the hope? The hope is the exaltation, the glorification. So why am I going through sanctification? In the hope of glorification. Why did Jesus lay aside his divine privilege? So that he could fulfill the Father's plan and have exaltation. So this same attitude. How can I uh, live in this life and have joy? How can I be a servant in this life and still have joy? He's going to show us the example of Jesus Christ. Now, we're not going to, we could spend all kinds of time here because it is so deep. We're going to do a, a cursory reading of it, but this is one of the top four, we're going to call them Christological passages in the Bible. So there's four passages in the Bible that really explain to us Messiah, Jesus Christ, uh, what he actually is like. We've already gone through one of them, which is uh, John, I'm sorry, yeah, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. We've already studied through them. Now we're going to go through uh, verses 1 through 18 here. Um, there's another text that we're going to go to next in Colossians, Colossians 2, 13 through 23. And then we've got Hebrews 1, the first three verses. Explain to us a lot about Jesus Christ. So remember John 1, uh, verse 14, where it says, Hey, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here we have... Have this attitude, verse 5, in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God. Let's just take that. What does it mean that he existed in the form of God? So remember, Jesus didn't have a beginning. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought in John 3, 16, it says he's only begotten. And that is absolutely true. But let's not think of only begotten as birth. Let's think of it this way, that the Son has eternally come forth from the Father. Okay? The Son has eternally come forth from the Father. Is he from the Father? Yes. He's the only child of God. Remember, the rest of us are children of God, but we're adopted sons. He's the only begotten Son. Okay? So the only way we can become adopted sons is to be in the only begotten Son. Okay. Jesus never has had a beginning. He's eternal. So it says he existed in the form. This word is a very difficult word, but it's the same essence, the same substance as God the Father. There's no difference. Three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, same essence. So although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God the Father a thing to be grasped. Now let's get this. In the Father's plan, the Son would have to be humiliated, brought low. And so with all of his divine privilege, how could he be brought low? He's still God even when he became man. He's still the same essence as God the Father. However, he had to lay aside his divine privilege. What does this look like? This, this actually has the saying of this. He didn't hold on to his divine rights and privileges. He didn't hold on to them at all cost. His privileges and his rights were not what defined him. What defined him was his love for the Father. So he was obedient, laid aside his divine privileges. And it says this, um, but emptied, this word kenosis in the Greek, emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Now let's think through this. The emptying of himself was this. All of his divine right, his sovereignty to do, he laid aside to be led by the Spirit. First time we see this is when he's going into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And it says 
that Jesus, being led by the Spirit, went out into the wilderness where he was tempted. Okay, so Jesus was depending on the guidance of the Holy Spirit in what he was doing in his earthly body. He emptied himself, taking on the form of what? A doulos, a bond servant. Remember we said a doulos was not just a regular slave. This was a slave who was set free. However, in set, being set free, he willingly submitted himself to his master and chose to be a slave for the master. Same thing with you and I. If you're a Christian, you chose to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You laid that down. Jesus laid it down. So not only is he being humbled in his divinity, but really, he's even being humbled when compared with other human beings. I mean, there's a very small, low population of humanity who are slaves. And so not only was he humbled in his divinity, but even compared to other human beings, he was humbled. So get that picture of Jesus. And when we start thinking that humility is a bad thing, Start chewing on this attitude that Jesus had. Remember, we in our natural flesh seem to think that success in life is being served. But Jesus said, true life comes not from being served, but by serving. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What's a ransom? That's the price paid for redemption. Remember, redemption, I was born a slave, but yet in Jesus Christ I have been set free. What's the result of that? That I now, like Christ, have the same attitude where I am willing to sacrifice my life to reach other slaves. He goes on. He says, and being found and being made in the likeness of men. It's just very difficult for me to even comprehend the same creator who spoke the world into existence, placing himself in that creation. And in such a way that no one would ever look on him as anything special. says this, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. There's that word, obedient. So God the Father, even though it was God the Father's plan for the incarnation, Jesus willingly submitted. That's the only way you can be obedient is when you willingly submit. Jesus out of love for the Father. It wasn't his divine rights that defined him, it's his love for the Father that defined him. Which is also what makes the incarnation so painful for Jesus. Because the one thing that he held with greatest regard was his love for the Father. And at one point he knows that he's going to be separated from the Father. Look what it says. He humbled himself by coming becoming obedient to the point of death, and not just any death, but the most cruel death possible, death on a cross. So that kind of sums up the humbling of Jesus. And so let's now look at, because he chose to humble himself for God the Father's plan, let's see what the result of it is, the exaltation. It says this, for this reason also God, the Father, highly exalted him and bestowed him a, him a name which is above what? Every name. Now, it's interesting in the world we live in, people want to make a name for themselves, right? And how do we make a name for ourselves? Well, we want to be a big man and we have to get other people to do our will. And it comes really from the boastful pride of life and from selfishness and self-love. I think my way is best, so I'm going to impose.
impose that on everyone else. Um, but Jesus, his name is great because God the Father made it great through his obedience. Not through him imposing and forcing others, but by him sacrificing himself and loving others. It's the total antithesis of anything that this world or our fleshly natures would come up with. Why did God highly exalt him with his name? So that at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee will bow. Everyone will worship Jesus. Look what it says. Of those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth. So a couple things here. In heaven, those who have died in Christ, along with the two-thirds of the angels that continue to follow uh, God and serve God. So people who have died in Christ and are in heaven and the two thirds that are the angels. Then it says those who are on the earth, those who have not yet died, both people who are Christians and who aren't Christians. Uh, Christians will bow as they have ever since they surrendered their life to the Lord. When the unsaved world, people who are still on earth, see Jesus Christ for the first time, they will bow the knee. Also, it says that those who are under the earth, so those who are in hell awaiting the lake of fire, these are the third of the angels who are already sealed and the people who have died without Christ and are awaiting eternal punishment. So everyone will bow, but know that they will not bow by faith. The ones that have bowed by faith, have already bowed by faith while they said their physical life. But now when they see Jesus, everyone's going to be bowing. The problem is if you don't bow until you see Christ, there's no salvation in Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith. Remember Romans 2, 8, I mean Ephesians 2, 8, 9? That not of yourselves, the gift of God, not a matter of works, lest anyone should bow. So some will bow just before they're ushered into eternal separation from God. Look what it says. It says this. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So think about this. Right now, the Holy Spirit comes in and seals us, right? That's the engagement ring that we have. How do we know I have the Holy Spirit? I'm in the Word. It's producing conviction for me. Then by faith, I say I believe what God's saying about me, not what I think. So I'm confessing. I'm confessing what? I'm confessing my sin. But another way of saying that is confessing Jesus as Lord. You say, what do you mean? Every time I confess a sin in my life, I'm saying sin means I've missed the mark. I've missed the mark of what? I've missed the mark of the standard, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the standard. And when I sin, I've missed that mark. So I'm submitting myself to the standard of Jesus Christ. And so here it says every tongue, when they see Christ, they're going to confess. At the great white throne judgment, there's two books that are going to be open. One is going to be the book of of life, the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're gonna be separated from God. But the other book that's gonna be open is the Book of Works. What are they confessing? They're gonna be confessing their sin because they're in the presence of God. They're gonna be confessing how much they have fallen short of the standard. Yet it's gonna be by sight, not by faith, and there's gonna be no salvation in it. Salvation is something that's offered right now by grace through faith. And if I'm going to receive salvation by grace through faith, I must surrender my life. And when I surrender my life in justification, the Holy Spirit's coming in me and he's going to start this descent in me. He's going to start this humbling, this humiliation of me called sanctification. Dealing with my sin showing me my faults. But all the while as he's helping me with these, he's going to be comforting me that 
eternal condemnation is taken away. So chew on this. Um, he, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To magnify the character of God. Remember, back to Ephesians 3, the whole reason God created this physical world was to make a point to the third of the angels that fell that God is good. And whereas uh, the angels have rebelled against God, even when seeing him, they were in his presence and saw him, and some of them still uh, rejected God. A third of them followed Lucifer. He said, but I'm going to create a world in which I'm going to give people a free choice, and they're not even going to see me, and some of them are going to choose me by faith. Of course, some won't, but some will. All for the glory to show the grace and the mercy of God and that God is good. So we get to verse 12. This is going to be showing us how this, what does this look like for us? We've shown the perfect example of humiliation and exaltation. Now what for us? He says this. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Okay, so we're, this isn't just a relationship with Paul where Paul's coming, so we better get this stuff right. No, Paul ushered them into a relationship with God. God is with them 24-7. So these, Paul's saying, this is not about my presence or my absence. This is about a walk with God all the time. And he says, do what? Work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Should this be something that we examine? Should this humiliating, difficult process be going on? You better be examining it. You better make sure this is happening in your life. Because let me tell you something. Satan will deceive you. He will do any kind of th substitute. He will mimic God in everything. The one thing he will not mimic is confession and repentance. I've even seen sometimes people try to uh, just do confession, but it won't be coupled with repentance, and it definitely won't be coupled with uh, uh, ongoing humility. These are things that Satan does not like, but God uh, values. Work out your own salvation. This, what is salvation? Remember, justification, sanctification, and glorification. So if we say, okay, I've surrendered my life to the Lord. I have justification. How do I know I have justification? If this humbling process of sanctification is going on, now, Jesus was humbled in living a righteous life. I don't have a righteous life. I'm in Christ, so now I'm practicing righteousness. Jesus never had to confess sin because he never sinned. I, however, and you, we have sinned. And so we're not righteous. We're practicing righteousness. Go back and read the first three chapters of 1 John and see how that all plays out. Let's keep going. He says this, ultimately, we're justified. We're going through this humi humiliation of sanctification with the hope of one day, the exaltation of glorification. Look what it says. For it is God who is at work in you, okay, Holy Spirit, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Don't miss this. Your life is not yours anymore if you're a Christian. It's for his good pleasure to will and to work. The salvation process is the will and the work. What does that look like? Let's talk about the will. If we're going to just simplify this, the will would be loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. How can we have the same mind? How can we have the same heart because the soul the will has been surrendered how does that happen in this process of communing with god 
where his spirit works on, in, and through me. So the will is the loving God part. The work then would be loving my neighbor as myself. You can't possibly do the work until the will is put on the altar as a living sacrifice. Go read Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And then he says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Remember, God is calling every Christian to a life of doulos, to a life of a bondservant, a slave. But there's going to be a war inside me with, I don't like being a slave. Why? Why am I a slave? Because I willingly chose to serve God. To do His will. To do His work. So as I commune with Him, then He guides me in the work that I should do to carry out His good pleasure. What does God get to do? Anything He jolly well wants to. It's about His good pleasure. Not about Him doing my good pleasure. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 14 is right in line. Do all things without what? Grumbling or disputing. I love the word grumbling. Grumbling is more of uh, just a sound. It's an onomatopoeia word. <laughs> just to be fancy, onomatopoeia means the word in the original language kind of mimics the sound. Like, <laughs> grumble. I don't like what's going on. Mumbling. Have you ever had your children mumble under their breath? That's grumbling, right? Grumbling and mumbling. And, uh, and disputing. Okay, arguing. So don't talk under your breath if you're my kid. And don't sass me. Don't talk back. The disputing back. Why? Why should we not do this? Now, <laughs> when I'm a slave... And I've willingly chosen to be a slave. Why should I be grumbling or talking back when my master tells me to do something? It was my choice to surrender to God. Was it your choice to surrender to God? Well, then when God is trying to bring you to full maturity so that you can be a productive part of the gospel inheritance, that you can make disciples, how come you're fighting that? How come... We're, and every one of us does this. But let's call it sin. Let's get it right before God and let's repent of it. Turn from our grumbling and our talking back so that you will prove yourselves to be what? Two things. Blameless and innocent. He doesn't say perfect. Again, blameless means there's no skeletons in my closet. Okay? I've been declared innocent. Okay? In Christ. Uh, children of God above reproach. Nobody's got any dirt on me. Compared with, in the midst of a crooked and perverse uh, generation. So the word blameless, connect that, the opposite is crooked. Innocent, the opposite word is perverse. So as is, is different as light and dark is the difference between the children of God and the children of the world. 1 John 3.10 The difference between the children of God and the children of Satan is obvious. Anyone who loves God practices righteousness and loves their brother. Okay? Same thing. We've got the same great commandment coming at it from a hundred different directions so that we might fully comprehend what God's pleasure, what God's will, and what God's work is for our life. Look what it says. Now, he left us here so that we would what? Appear as lights in the world. Remember what Jesus said back in Matthew 5. He says there's two things that Christians are in the world, salt and light. Salt is a preserver. Light is a revealer. Remember, he says, let your light so shine that when 
people around you see your good works and the good works are not buying somebody's coffee in Dunkin' Donuts. The good works are the good works that God ordained before him. Remember Ephesians 2.10, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God is the one that is going to guide them. It's about his good pleasure, his work. What's that initial work? Is the initial work of sanctification, of humbling ourselves. This CCR practice, where our hope is the exaltation of glorification, but first we must go through this sanctification process. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's keep going. It says this. Um, holding fast what? What's going to help us in this? We've already talked about the Holy Spirit helping us here, but also coupled with the word of life. Holding fast to the 66 books that we have, the Bible, so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Paul says, I've expended my life to be able to present the gospel to you. And if I did all of this, even in prison right now, so that you could get the gospel, and then you just get the gospel and just keep it with yourself. You don't ever grow to full completion. You don't ever make disciples yourself. He said, what I have done is been in vain. I have no interest, as Paul had no interest, in teaching people who don't want to turn around and teach other people. This isn't just special, some special category that God has for cer certain uh, group of Christians. Every Christian is to be involved in the great commandment. And from the great commandment is going to be this love for others, which is carried out in the great commission. Everyone is involved. If you're not involved and you've been a Christian for years and not months, then you've really got to start examining, are you truly a Christian? And if you are, what has stopped you from growing to full maturity? And I can tell you, it's between your ears. There's some problem in your thinking. You're not single-minded, and you don't have a submissive mind. Let's keep going. It says, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, he said, Paul's saying, even if this is the end of my life and I'm just doing it to further your faith, he says, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. For you too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. A lot of joy talked about here. Okay, so we say, how do I live? in difficult circumstances and have joy by having one mind. What's my one purpose is the spread of God's kingdom through the gospel message. So then how do I serve others? How do I serve, how do I have joy in putting myself under other people, serving other people? I've got to have a submissive mind. I've got to be in this process of being humble. Very few Christians are in the process of being humble. So that really begs the question, are we really in sanctification then? And remember, the only evidence that one is justified is the sanctifying work going on. So if you're not in this sanctifying, humbling work, then you really got to question whether justification is just something you've made up in your own mind according to to your own standard rather than the standard that Christ has set. Remember, this isn't something you work hard at. This is something that God does in, on, and through us. Um, we get to verse 19, to the end of the chapter, and he's going to talk about two men. He's going to talk about Timothy and Epaphroditus. Um, now, let's just read it. It says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. He says, for I have no one else of kindred spirit who would genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Now, how sad is this? Out of all the people that Paul has discipled, out of all the young men that he's brought along, 
The only one that's still with him is Timothy. The only one that he can trust to really put the gospel out there is Timothy. He says the rest of them are all like we talked about in chapter 1. They're putting the gospel out there for their own benefit. Something of selfish ambition. It says, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. If we were going to put it in today's thoughts, they're in the ministry. They're in sharing the gospel to make their lives easier and more comfortable. Not putting their lives on the line and sacrificing their lives for the spread of the gospel. Remember, if you're going to be in this process, there's going to be this humbling of you. Exaltation comes at glorification at the end of our physical lives. It says this, but you know of his proven worth, Timothy's that is, that he served with me in the further, th furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Remember where Timothy came from. We talked about this Sunday. Paul came from Lystra. Paul comes to Lystra. They get mad at Paul. They throw him out of the city and they stone him to death. And then we know that God supernaturally raised him from the dead. He gets out of the pile of stones and he's got a choice. Look, do I go on to the next city or do I go back into Lystra? What does he do? He goes back into Lystra. And there's this boy there, this young man who has a Christian grandmother, who has a Christian mother, but yet has a pagan father. And he sees in Paul this father that he never had. And so he surrenders his life to Christ and he is a co-worker, a co-laborer with Paul. And uh, you can even feel the love that he has for Timothy right here. And he says, therefore, I hope to send him to you immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust that the Lord that myself also will be coming shortly. But remember, he doesn't know. He's sure of his deliverance, but he doesn't know whether his deliverance is going to come through physical death or whether it's going to come by him getting out so that he can do more work. Uh, then there's another guy that we talk about. His name is Epaphroditus. Now we know that the church at Philippi had put together an offering uh, to support Paul in his work. And even while he's in jail, he has to get funds together to eat and things like this. They had to come in and take care of his clothing. If he's going to write, he needs uh, the materials to write on and to write with. And so the church took up a collection, sent it uh, by way of Epaphroditus. And you've read it. Uh, while he was there in this traveling to give uh, Paul this gift Epaphroditus got sick, and he got so sick um, that it says right here um, in verse 27, for indeed he was sick, even to the point of death. Um, now, let, let's talk about this. The next phrase says, but God had mercy on him. Now, I'm sure they were praying for him to get well, but that's not the focus. Paul doesn't say your prayers were answered because Epaphroditus got better from his physical sickness. No, who's in charge of life or death? God is. Okay, so it's in God's hands. Paul makes it clear that God showed him mercy by giving Epaphroditus uh, his health back because Paul didn't want to have the sorrow of being in prison and then the sorrow of somebody sending him help and then that person dying by praying to bring him help. You see the, the thought process here. It says, verse 20, Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, uh, so that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy. And listen to this. Hold men like him in high regard. Why? Why should Epaphroditus be held in high regard? Why should Timothy be held in high regard? Look what it says. For the work of the Lord, risking his life to complete what was deficit in your service to me. 
here's two people, but specifically here, Epaphroditus, here's somebody who so wanted to be a part of the work of God that he was willing to sacrifice his own safety, his own comfort, and yes, his own life. How do you know if somebody's all in, if they're willing to sacrifice their own life? So that brings us to this question. We've had this massive chapter, this huge chapter of having unity, and this unity is through one word called humility, a submissive mind, a single mind to spread the gospel. And how am I going to spread the gospel? By having a servant's heart, not being forced into this, but from love for my master. I want to carry this out. The question comes to us and we must ask, what have I sacrificed for the spread of the gospel? What in my life am I willing to put on the line so that the gospel can go further? If it's still about your comfort, if your walk with God is all about your health, if your prayers are just about your safety and the people that you love, then you don't understand the gospel. The gospel is more important than our physical life. You see, the gospel is God's work here on earth. And we've got this small little window that by faith we can be part of it. So what I'm saying is, examine your heart. If you're not all in, take some time today. Pray, God, am I all in? What are you asking me to sacrifice? It's not just 10% of your money. God is wanting you to sacrifice your life for the furtherance of the gospel. And we are living in a dark day. And so the smallest amount of light will go a long ways. So examine your heart in this. I hope you're going to have a great day in the Lord as you sila, as you meditate on this. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for how you're working. Show us, Father, whether we're in this humiliation process, whether we're, we have this attitude in us as was in your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, your Son started off so lofty. We started so low. But Father, may we be able to compare ourselves to your Son, and may we see an accurate view of ourselves. And may that accurate view of ourselves push us toward greater dependence on you. It's in Jesus' name, your Son, that we pray.